Why did Norman take the sole route? I don't really know. Um, he, he just, you know, he liked to do so many different things, liked to listen to so much different music. And so, you know, he didn't want to get stuck in one category of music. He wanted to broaden his horizons. And there was black music coming from America, which, you know, a lot of us wasn't into at the time. He was different, his friends were different, and people used to call him Soul Boy. And what were you dressing like that for? And you know, Norman, he took the flack. Let not my people be forsaken. If there is a man to be blamed, let the politician be named. People here. Back in those days, every black kid needed to be in the sound system. Just like nowadays, every kid wants to be a footballer. It's just something that you did you know, a sense of belonging. You needed to belong to some um, collective. Other than that, you'd belong to a gang where you'd be getting up to no good. So the next best thing was to belong to a sound system, build your own sound system in a former collective. It was all about music, lifestyle and fashion. The three ingredients in what forms youth cults. For me, I was a West End boy already already where it's at. By the time anything had kind of found its way into um, suburban acceptance, those things had already started in the West End years before. We were already doing it. By the time it came out to your railways and your Burtons, we'd already said goodbye to it, moved on. You know, punks didn't start in Acton Town Hall, mate. You know, the whole lifestyle, the fashion, it all, everything starts in the centre of London, Soho. and experiencing the music live, particularly in the boroughs, not just Manhattan, but coming into the boroughs, Queens, Bronx, Brooklyn, the music lived. And that had a huge impact on me, that made a huge impression. So when I came back, every time I came back to the UK, I was fired up with, you know, a kind of uh, drive to somehow, some way, recreate that experience back in London. The importance of New York as a music centre couldn't be understated or couldn't be overstated. It was just, it was the mecca, it was the centre of the world as far as I was concerned. And at that time, perhaps the biggest track out here was Sheik's Good Times. And every DJ was cutting up this record, let's bring it back. And that was the first time I'd seen that kind of thing done. And it just left a huge impression on me. And then, you know, you get these moments of inspiration. Then it just dawned on me that good times is what we need to call the sound system. An old van, bundle a little bit of equipment we had in it and just drive in because there was no restrictions there at the time. Basically, me using all my powers of persuasion to persuade my brother that that's where we should go. If we really wanted to prove to ourselves and to our friends and all the other guys in all the other sound systems that we were going to be something, you know, Carnival, playing at Carnival was the acid test. Me and Norma were sharing the music at the time. I was playing a reggae set, he played a soul set, and uh, we, we got on that way. But Norman came into problems because at that time, the, most of the crowd was predominantly into reggae. So when Norman started playing his the soul records, a lot of them were a bit obscure, a lot of them were very funky, very dance. Um, a lot of people started booing, take off that, you know, soul boy music, and Norman became disillusioned with it, so I had to come back and play reggae to rescue him. But, like I said, that kind of motivated me even more. I liked the fact that people were quite uncomfortable with what I was doing, so that basically made it more um, appealing to me. I suppose it was the, 
kind of punk attitude in me at the time. just a logical extension to what I was already doing. Um, I was putting on parties all around my locality of West London, like, you know, you know Acton, Notting Hill, Ealing, Shepherd's Bush, uh, Kensington. I was doing loads of parties in big Victorian houses around there, and the parties began to grow in appeal. So I just needed bigger and bigger premises in which to hold these parties. So I started to look for huge loft spaces in factories, um, anywhere that was kind of exotic or exciting or strange. I looked for just the weirdest places to hold parties. Family Function was um, a sound system crew that grew out of North London. Um, me, Jules, a chap called Mark Rayner and uh, it grew from about 84, possibly even 85 onwards. We were all based in Camden, Highgate, Hampstead, North London guys, interested in dance music, come from um, a white dance music background and even roots in lots of other forms of music, but not traditionally in black music. And we felt that we needed to be doing something that was different to what was going on at the time. But they needed something that we had which was the sound system. And it was people like Judge Jules at the time and Dan Benedict. They knew that if they could marry this, their music with our sound system and our crowds, because our crowds were quite cool, but we had more of a, a black mixed crowd, the, per the marriage would be perfect. And Norman saw their crowd and saw our crowd and said, we can work together. Yeah, I was quite aware of the fact that I was integrating all sorts of people. I loved the fact I was getting off on that on a big way. I was very conscious of the fact that we were rewriting the rules on certain things. We were making it up as we went along because there had been no precedent set to what we were doing. So, <laughs> you know, we just rode the roller coaster, man. <laughs> contacted us to get on KISS FM was a guy called Tosca. He was partners with Gordon Mack at the time. And he called Norma. He actually came to the meeting here in this room to see if he can uh, recruit DJs. The music wasn't played on commercial stations because, by its very nature, it was deemed by the powers that be, you know, in UK broadcasting, that this music was uncommercial. Um, they really weren't into it, like myself, you know, who was into it for music for music's sake, because people simply wanted to hear good music. Um, you have to remember, commercial radio is commercially driven. Um, it's a business. With us, we were just um, enthusiastic, amateur hams. We were fans, basically, who were doing it out of some innocent love. On test. Welcome back to the radical sound of young London. That is KISS 94 FM. Once again, broadcasting to London and the home counties. Norman Jay's original rare groove show. We were reaching a completely new crossover audience for the first time. I know that because I was the first black DJ to be um, discovered or acknowledged by, you know, the white style and music media. 
I got a call one day after from one of my parties at my house um, from someone at the, the NME, would you believe? The New Musical Express, the bastion of white rock. <laughs> Wanted to know what a little black DJ from West London was doing, doing these parties illegally, attracting thousands of people. And, and basically the centre of a new musical hype called Rare Groove. It was news, it was a story. When we started the warehouse parties, um, I for one knew that they would only run for a limited time. I knew it would only be a matter of time before the authorities sussed what we were doing and perhaps would come in heavy handed with an iron fist to stamp out this youth movement. DJs have the best seat in the house. You see, you see it all, from the first person who walks into the last person who goes, and you see people getting together. You see people meeting. I used to watch people as a as a part of my hobby when I was in between playing records. I used to just watch people get together. And I bet he's going to get together. With her. I bet he's going to chat her up. And you could see it. You could see people meeting. You could see friendships forming. And I don't know. People just took each other. It didn't matter what you did for a living. When you're in a club, it's just it, it's just it's the status quo is there. You know. You know, there's no getting away from it. When there's someone and there's people like normal up up, up front, saying what they're saying in the way that they, that he says it, which is with no compromise, it changes. It, it helps to change things. <laughs> probably the last great London party that actually unites all different sorts of people, you know, Sloney white girls, black raggers from Acton, you know, kids from football and, and it's the last, it is the last great warehouse party. Some of the busiest rhymes ever made by man are going into this mic written by this hand are coming out of this mouth made by this tongue. I tell you now, my man, my name is Young. But so you think that this your destiny to get the best of me. But I suggest to be quiet, but don't even try it from the east and west of me. Taking it and never breaking it or even shaking it, grooving it and always moving it because I'm not faking it. Pulling out rhymes like books off the shelf. Born in England, raised a holler, stop to go for myself. This is stone cold rhyming, no frills, no fluffs, and it's no accident that these rhymes sound tough. I'm going off, baby, there's no turning back. I'm on your TV, on your album cassette, and eight track. And when the show is finally finished, I'll be taking my bath, my name is Jungle, yo, I got no how. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> 